everyone, and welcome back to uh, week five of Introduction to Lithic Analysis. Uh, we'll be talking about artifact and site interpretation this week. Uh, so to start, I just wanted to do a quick little review on last week's material, which focused on the Paleolithic or the Stone Age. Uh, so the Paleolithic and Stone Age are divided into three components, which are the Lower Paleolithic, the Middle Paleolithic, and the Upper Paleolithic, or the Early Stone Age, Middle Stone Age, and Late Stone Age. Um, so the Lower Paleolithic, Early Stone Age are the oldest. Uh, the earliest technology that was introduced is the Lamequian, which is dated at approximately 3.3 million years ago and is associated with early hominins such as Kenyanthropus. Uh, this, uh, the Lamequian is basic flaked technology with evidence of possible bipolar napping and plant processing. After the Lamequian, we see the Old One, which is dated to uh, between about 2.6 to 1.7 million years ago. This one is mostly associated with Homo habilis. Uh, the Old One is also considered Mode 1 tool technology, which consists of basic core and flake tools. The primary technique used here was freehand napping, um, creating roughly shaped flaked tools. Uh, the final technology in the Lower Paleolithic Early Stone Age is the Acheulean. This one is significantly more sophisticated than the older one and consists primarily of hand axes and other large cutting tools. These tools belong to Mode 2, Mode 2. <laughs> Uh, due to the technological advance of shaping and retouching being used here. This is generally associated with uh, Homo erectus, but is continued by other early humans as well, such as Homo sapiens uh, and Neanderthal, as well as Homo heidelbergensis and you know so on and so forth. Um, it's also the longest practice tool tradition uh, of the of all of them actually, practiced from about 1.7 million years ago to about 800,000 years ago. And this takes us into the Middle Paleolithic or the Middle Stone Age. Uh, the most common industry here is the Mosterian. This is usually associated with Neanderthals, um, but in some cases is associated with early humans or Cro-Magnons. It's classed as Mode 3 because of the switch to prepared core techniques, such as the Levala, which we've discussed previously. After the Mousterian, we have the Upper Paleolithic and the Late Stone Age, and here we see the transition to Mode 4 technology with the appearance of the Orignation. Mode 4 is defined by the appearance, the appearance of blades and specialized reduction techniques towards uh, extracting blades. This continues through the Gravettian and Solutrian as well with minor changes defining each industry. Um, the terminal phase of the Upper Paleolithic and Late Stone Age is the Magdalenian, uh, where we see the introduction of Mode 5 tools, which corresponds with the widespread use of microlithic technology. So the emphasis on small agile microliths continues through the Mesolithic and Neolithic as well. And the Neolithic, by contrast, is characterized by the appearance of specialized tools related more specifically to plant domestication, such as adzes and scythes. Our topic today is about inferring function of artifacts and sites, starting with uh, artifact interpretation. A lot of extensive research has gone into how to properly interpret the function of stone tool artifacts, but prior to Semenov's uh, 1964 study, which was on the microscopic analysis techniques, there was no real definitive way to interpret stone tool functionality, so most of it was based on morphology. So I'm not going to get into um, microware and microscopic analysis too much this week, um, aside from some brief mentions here and there, uh, because microscopic analysis is going to be the topic of next week's lecture. So if you want to know more, tune in next week uh, to hear about microscopic techniques and what we can gain from doing microscopic analysis of lithics. Uh, as we will discuss next week, microware analysis does have its own pitfalls, however, uh, one being a high level of subjectivity and analyst, or analyst bias. Uh, however, it still has proven to be incredibly useful in interpreting stone tools. 
These advancements in microware analysis have helped to break down the notion that tool morphology strictly governs uh, tool function, indicating that most stone tools were used for a variety of tasks. One of the other primary ways to uh, study possible tool use uh, function aside from microware analysis, is through ethnographic comparisons. Um, by looking at how contemporary groups manufacture and use stone tools, we can draw inferences about how similar tools were made and used in the past. Um, the notion that stone tool functionality is variable and not limited by shape is supported through a lot of ethnographic uh, studies as well. One example is Gould's 1968 study of Aboriginal populations in Australia, which ultimately proved that stone tool function was based upon a tool's working edge more so than its overall form. Um, this is supported in another study as well by White and Thomas done in 1972, which indicates that uh, New Guinea Highlanders considered their stone tools as simple pieces of stone suitable for a variety of tasks rather than a specific to a form. Overall, such ethnographic studies tend to prove that there is a lack of correlation between artifact form and artifact function exclusivity. Despite all this, archaeologists still tend to classify stone tools by form, and there are some tool forms that do correspond extensively with specific activities and uses. Artifact names tend to reflect those of modern day tools attributing a particular function to the artifact, such as the terms arrowheads, drills, scraper, cleaver, etc. But as we know now, morphology is not always a constraint on multifunctionality. For example, end scrapers are generally considered to be tools used for animal skin working. Uh, and while such activities have been supported by ethnographic records, end scrapers are not limited to this task alone and can also be used for a variety of other things. Projectile points are, as the name suggests, assumed to be the tip or point of projectile weaponry such as spears, arrows, or darts. Uh, this is also inferred by the similarities between stone and modern arrowhead tips. However, microware analysis has indicated that artifacts of this type also appear to have been used as cutting and butchering tools. Hafted bifaces, also uh, initially perceived to be solely used as spear points, have been seen to be used for tasks such as slicing, cutting, sawing, whittling, scraping, splitting, and piercing. Microliths and microblades can take on a number of forms, but overall they've been considered to be used as inserts for projectile weaponry. And while this is often the case, there is also evidence uh, from microware analysis to suggest that these microliths were also used for activities such as cutting, engraving, drilling, and shaving. Just of note, as we move into the, uh, this portion of the lecture, in case it's not just implied inherently, uh, when interpreting sites using lithics, it's incredibly important to consider assemblages as a whole rather than individual artifacts. Uh, so now we're going to get into site interpretation. And as most of you probably know, archaeologists use artifacts to interpret sites. And so it makes sense that lithics are often used to draw inferences about human behavior and site use. And this is especially important with early sites, such as Paleolithic or Stone Age sites. However, since we know that lithics are not always functionally diagnostic, this can present some problems when it comes to interpreting site use and is one of the reasons why it's so important to consider assemblages as a whole. Aside from determining site use, lithics can also be helpful in understanding site formation processes, uh, which can be done by studying the distribution of artifacts throughout a site, interpreting levels of site disturbance through artifact movement, assessing the significance of taphonomic factors, uh, which we've addressed in lithic analysis such as roundedness or thermal alteration and patina, and so on. Uh, for these kinds of studies, spatial data is also of high importance to interpret the assemblage. Anyone who's taken anthropology or archaeology ever has probably heard about Lewis Binford because of his many foundational contributions to the field. Uh, Binford also played a fundamental role in understanding prehistoric site function of hunter-gatherer populations. 
He characterized these groups by the different strategies of mobility that they used, distinguishing between foragers and collectors. These groups were defined by levels of mobilities practiced by their groups classified as either residential or logistical. In residential mobility, entire groups would pick up camp and move it from one place to another, transferring entire populations at once, with uh, mobility essentially limited to setting up large camps in different areas as needed. This is related to the foraging lifestyle. Logistical mobility involved the movement of small groups of individuals from their main camp to smaller specialized camps for various activities, and uh, this was related to the collector lifestyle. While we know uh, it's not so cut and dry as to be able to lump things into these defining terms uh, solely and definitively, archaeologists still often use these ideas as a framework for understanding site function through artifact diversity and assemblage variability. The role of artifact diversity in assemblages is really important to consider when interpreting sites, although it can be a complicated one. In some studies, artifact diversity has shown an inverse relationship with a residential mobility, which indicates that as mobility increases, artifact diversity decreases. Um, other studies present the idea that for specialized task sites or field camps, such as those used for hunting, plant collecting, butchering, and so on, there should be a relatively low artifact diversity as the artifacts should reflect uh, the specialized task being performed. So for sites where limited activities were performed, there should be a lower number of artifact types present. Um, Price's 1978 study shows an aspect of how mobility is reflected by lithic diversity, presenting data that indicates a greater diversity of artifacts at base camp, uh, where a wide range of generalized activities were conducted, as opposed to special purpose camps, where singular specialized tasks were performed. Um, and as would be expected, special purpose camps had fewer artifact types present as compared to base camps. Base camps were also represented by a greater or density, um, a greater density of artifacts as a whole, indicating heavier usage of the site. In other words, if a narrow range of activities were performed at a particular location, uh, it should be expected to find a relatively low number of artifact types. Another interesting correlation with high artifact diversity and mobility is in regards to sedentism. Uh, a number of studies have shown that there is more artifact diversity in assemblages associated with mobile groups than with sedentary groups. Similarly, the level of effort put into tool production can also be correlated with level of sedentism. Some studies on this topic, uh, such as that done by Perry and Kelly, have indicated that more informal tools tend to be associated with more sedentary groups, whereas formal tools tend to be associated with mobile groups. This could be for a multitude of reasons, but is generally attributed to the overall needs of existence. When living a highly mobile life, it is important to come prepared for a variety of tasks, and thus tools become more valuable of a commodity. This can be related to issues such as the time expenditure of making a tool or the uncertainty of material availability, uh, which can contribute to the need to have flexible, transportable, and modifiable tools. And by contrast, sedentary groups are generally more stable in raw material availability and are able to safely manufacture and use tools as needed, which opens up the market for expedient tools that can be easily made, used, and discarded over short periods of time. Artifact diversity can also be related to the amount of time spent at or the length of occupation of a site. Basically, sites that are occupied for longer periods of time should have a greater artifact diversity, whereas sites with short-term occupations have uh, more restricted artifact types. This is reflected in Kuhn's 1991 study um, of two different Musterian sites in Italy. Grotta Guattari and Grotta de Sant'Agostino. His findings indicated that uh, Grotta Guattari, the site with shorter term occupations, contained higher levels of retouched tools, whereas uh, Grotta de Sant'Agostino, uh, which was the site with longer term occupations, contained significantly less retouched tools and a greater abundance of unretouched flakes. 
A lot of information about site function can be gained from interpreting preserved aspects of stone tool production as well. For a long time, uh, flint napping was a part of everyday existence and was therefore heavily ingrained into how sites were used and maintained. This relates back to one of Binford's ethnographic observations regarding flint napping sites, indicating that flint napping stations can be identified by a series of characteristics related to the production process, such as disposal sequences and processes. This, um, the production process uh, would often be done in sequences, uh, which could be used to distinguish different activity areas. And a really cool example of this is Hayden's 2012 study of a Mousterian site where he interprets Neanderthal habitation sites in terms of activity area. Uh, in this case, there are clearly defined napping areas, processing areas, and hearths, as well as blank spots that are assumed to be sleeping areas. Other areas of stone tool variability often are related to raw material, and some common factors include raw material availability, differential transport of raw materials, and tool function. It is generally assumed that raw material variability will be dependent on occupation as well with short-term sites exhibiting a higher degree of material variability compared to sites with long-term occupation, which tend to show less material variability. Uh, part of this is founded on the idea that non-local materials are going to be more common in short-term sites, and sites that have longer-term occupations would be more abundant in materials that are immediately available. Mobile groups have a larger range of resource exploitation due to their more frequent movement across wider areas of land, making them more likely to gather material as needed and transport it long distances or from one area to another. Refitting lithics is a really interesting concept which can contribute to understanding about site formation and occupation patterning as well. Uh, things such as site disturbance, refuse deposition, and occupation duration can all be gained from refit analysis. If you're not familiar with this concept, refitting is basically the reconstruction of the stone tool production process by fitting together flakes to a core in the order in which they were extracted, uh, kind of like a puzzle. And this is really useful in helping to understand the production techniques that were employed and can also help to understand the cognitive processes that go into a napping sequence. It can also be really relevant in interpreting site disturbance by examining the location of refit pieces through vertical and horizontal planes, tracking the distance that they were moved and drawing inferences about that distribution, uh, such as the influence of tra trampling on the site. It can also lend a lot of insight into behavioral patterns by expressing the different methods of waste disposal and refuse clearing. Typically, large pieces will be removed during intentional waste displacement and placed in a secondary location, while small debris pieces are more likely to be skimmed over and remain in the primary loca uh, location of deposition. The disposal of lithics is very different from other types of materials, such as wood and bone refuse, which can easily be disposed of by burning. And so these refuse disposal patterns can also provide information about the duration of site occupation. An example of this is a project done by Toby Marrow on the Twin Ditch site in Illinois, which used refitting to address the role of site disturbance and site formation processes. Another example is the case of Pincevent, a Magdalenian site in France, where refitting projects contributed to the reconstruction of a large habitation and workshop site with researchers able to identify distinct activity areas. The scholars even assert the identification of individuals based on skill levels shown through the napping process exhibited through the refits. So they were able to determine professional nappers, expert nappers versus uh, practicing nappers. This contributes to discussions around social organization, cultural behaviors, and habitation patterns, among other things. Um, but however, Lithic refitting, uh, though it is very interesting and useful, does have a bad reputation of being extremely time consuming, so it's not always practical depending on project constraints. And that's going to be all for this week. As always, I know it goes by really fast and it covers a lot of variable topics and uh, 
sometimes complicated material. So please reach out if you have any questions or even if you just want to chat about the material at all. Next week uh, is our final lecture, which uh, will be focusing on microscopic analysis techniques such as skinning electron microscopy, as well as illustration techniques and standardized procedures for artifact illustration. Uh, thanks for joining and I'll see you next week.